welcome. Uh, and in fact, people beyond the bailiwick welcome. Uh, this is the most recent update and most recent press uh, briefing in connection with COVID-19. Two weeks a day to Christmas. So hopefully, thankfully, this should be the last briefing uh, before Christmas. Uh, now, in relation to, uh, and it'll be, I think it'll be an update, uh, an upbeat uh, uh, briefing. And I think that the, you will like hearing the information that's going to be given to you. Now, in respect of that, of course, we've heard much about vaccinations and vaccines and questions that will be asked about, have we got some? How many have we got? Uh, when will that be rolled out? Well, uh, Deputy Burrard and Dr Brink will speak to you uh, about that. Now, one thing we should be saying in, in connection with all of this is, of course, that although the vaccination programme will start uh, shortly, it's going to take a time. And we have absolutely no intent, as we sit here today, uh, in releasing or uh, relaxing in any way our travel restrictions, because this will take a time. The people of the Bailiwick have been so prudent, so sensible uh, and so balanced that we don't want to unlock uh, and undo all the good work that has taken place. Now, one of the things that's happened, of course, particularly in the last weekend, is many of our students have come back, and that's gone very smoothly. Uh, and uh, the chief executive, uh, Paul Whitfield, will tell you about that. And so far, we've had no problems. We don't anticipate uh, that there will be any problems. Now, continuity is important in situations such as that. And my able uh, colleague, Deputy Soulsby, has been the continuous face, political face, uh, on these briefings since they commenced. And... Uh, she will, before we turn over to the hopefully sensible, I'm sure they will be sensible and seasonal questions from the media, uh, she will give a review of where we are over the last uh, over the last year. And she'll have some good news for you as well, something we'll refer to at the very end of our briefing. Now, of course, everything has got consequences. Everything has got consequences. And sadly, the economic consequences for the Bailiwick and other places as a result of this uh, virus have not been great, but we're going to have an economic overview which is going to be released shortly after the end of this briefing and will be available on gov.gg. Now, there's various ways of, we of measuring economies, and Guernsey, one of the ways of measuring it is gross added value, or gross value added, whatever you call it. Now, that's going to show uh, at the end of this year that our economy will have contracted by about 6.5%. Now, that's a big percentage, but it's better than uh, those that surround us and are near us and even further afield. That doesn't mean we're complacent because it's still going to have significant economic consequences for uh, the bailiwick. Now, we know that construction, we know that retail uh, to a degree, and we know that other sectors have bounced back, uh, but they've still got a way to come back. But there are, like everything, there's caution uh, and there's resolve. And the finance sector, which has always been for many years the backbone of our economy, uh, in the third quarter has shown signs of not stagnation, that would be the wrong word, but of not growing or not uh, developing uh, in a way that other sectors have. But we still have confidence that our economy will bounce back next year. And we're predicting, because that's all you can do at the moment, uh, that uh, our economy will bounce back somewhere between two and five perhaps two and two and a half and five percent, whatever it may be. But of course, that is a variant uh, and we can't be saying uh, that uh, that will be with certain. What is absolutely, absolutely certain is that for the years to come, we'll need the prudent economic uh, balance that Guernsey has adopted over a number of years and that uh, the economy will be such that there won't be money to spend on uh, vanity projects and there won't be money to waste. Every penny will have to be properly spent. Anyway, enough of me. Deputy Brouard will now uh, tell you some good news. Thank you, Peter. Uh, last week saw the announcement from the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine has been authorised for use in the UK. As I said at the last briefing, the bailiwick has been taking steps to ensure that the states of Guernsey is prepared, both with legislation and practically, to implement a programme as soon as a vaccine was available. The Local Medicines Committee met on the 3rd of December and recommended to the Committee for Health and Social Care to, one, designate the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for use in the bailiwick for individuals aged over 16, and secondly, to adopt the priority groups for coronavirus vaccination as advised by the UK's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JVCI. 
The Medicines Committee also recommended that they should and will keep under review any emerging evidence locally and also from other jurisdictions in respect of any adverse reactions to the vaccine. The recommendations of the Medicines Committee were shared with the Policy and Resources Committee as well as Sark and Alderney with whom the Health and Social Care Committee has a duty to consult before designating a vaccine. All those who were consulted confirmed their support for the recommendations of the Medicine Committee, which were then considered by Health and Social Care at a meeting on Tuesday this week. I'm pleased to confirm that HSC considered the report from the Medicines Committee and the feedback from the consultation, and I, can now, and I have now signed the necessary regulations to designate the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for use in the bailiwick. These regulations came into effect on Wednesday, the 9th of December. In parallel with the necessary regulatory requirements needed to enable coronavirus vaccination programme in the bailiwick, the necessary infrastructure to receive and administer the vaccine is also in place. The first consignment of the vaccine uh, was received in Guernsey this week. The arrival of the vaccine means that the rollout of the first phase of immunisation in line with the latest information and advice from the UK can begin. Dr Brink will provide the details on this shortly. I am pleased that the first phase of vaccine delivered will be administered across the Channel, Channel Islands next week. This is exciting news for the bailiwick and represents something of a light at the end of the tunnel in our fight against the coronavirus. As Deputy Fairbrush said, we must not be complacent, but the rollout of the vaccine is a significant milestone. Please remember that the vaccine is not compulsory. It's entirely voluntary. And if you are offered the vaccine, you must make a decision on whether to have it or not. Whilst information on the vaccine is available on the coronavirus website, you may also wish to speak to a health professional before you make a final decision. Please make sure if you are looking for information on the internet, you are using reputable sources information. Again, a link to an independent source of information about the vaccine is available on the state's website and also is including a video. The initial doses of the vaccine will be delivered in accordance with the agreed JVCI priority list. Please do not call to find out when you will be offered the vaccine. And I'll just repeat that. Please do not phone up to find out when you will be offered the vaccine. Each cohort will receive written correspondence ahead of that particular phase of the programme starting. Before Dr Brink provides you with more detailed information about the vaccine and other matters, I would like to personally thank everyone involved in the rollout of the vaccination programme. This has enabled the Bailo to start the programme ahead of this Christmas. This has only been achieved due to hard work, determination and an ability to work at pace. And for that, I, and I'm sure the rest of the community, are extremely grateful. Thank you. And now over to Dr Brink. So thank you very much. So I've essentially got four things that I wanted to update you all on. The first is our current statistics. The second, and probably most importantly, is, of course, the vaccination. I also wanted to briefly touch on the BETS programme and the testing that we're doing with regard to that. And finally, also to mention some of the data that we have from our border testing since the 1st of December. So starting off with our current information, as I'm sure you all know, we have a total of 289 positive cases since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. 37 of those came from the start of September, and currently we only have two active cases within the bailiwick. So we're in an extremely fortunate position as we go into the immunization program to only have, to have no evidence of community transmission of COVID-19 within our community. Really good position to be in. So if we now turn to the vaccination program, extremely exciting day yesterday when the first doses of um, vaccine arrived on the island. We received just under 1,000 doses of vaccine, so 975 to be, um, to be um, precise. We are going to deliver the first part of the vaccination program within the Princess Elizabeth Hospital, within the Emma Fairbrush Room, which is our second and smaller vaccination centre. So the groups that we'll be immunising in the first instance are our care and residential home staff, 
together with some of our other frontline staff. Now, what we need to do is we can't immunize every member of a single group at the same time, because of course the vaccine can cause some pain in the arm. You can, some people might get a slight fever, might feel a bit flu-like. So from a point of business continuity, we're going to cycle people in to the immunization program. So that's really important. So we've been working hard on lists of individuals, um, People have already had letters delivered to them in that first tranche. But we also want to ensure that we try and have equity to Alderney and Sark as well. Now, one of the problems or one of the issues with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is the transport of the vaccine post-defrosting. Um, and that's really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some of the frontline health and care workers from both Sark and Alderney over to the Princess Elizabeth Hospital and immunize them within the PEH. Now, this is a really rapidly moving field and that's really important for us as well. The Chadox, the, the Oxford vaccine, Chadox 1, has been submitted for approval to the MHRA. That is a far more thermostable vaccine and is more easy to try, easy to transport. So all the time we're looking at what vaccine availability, how we can immunize it, how we can optimize all of the plans to make sure that we deliver vaccine um, as fast as possible, but also in as safe a manner as possible to all of the eligible groups. Just to remind you, the initial aim of the vaccination program is to prevent morbidity, so severe disease and mortality, death, in the most vulnerable, vulnerable groups, but also to protect our health and care systems. So we're immunising along those guidelines. So that's with regard to the vaccine. So really positive um, news this week and a really, really exciting day um, for us working within the COVID programme. There are a few other things. The BETS program, the Bailiwick Extended Testing Strategy, that started and we're starting to look at testing some of the frontline staff. Um, we will then um, move in um, probably towards early next year, testing some of the care and residential um, staff members as well. So all of that um, is happening at the same time. The border testing is also working well. So since the 1st of December, we've tested over 1,000, 1,073 people have been tested. Um, our test uptake rate is over 80% and people arriving um, in the Bailiwick from a Category 4 region. And again, what I'd like to do is pay tribute to the students that have come in. They've complied to the to the guidance we've given them. They've um, had their tests and we really are really grateful to all they've done. And I think as we move towards the Christmas period, it's just for me to remind you about the most important things about staying healthy over the winter. So the usual respiratory etiquette, hand hygiene, stay at home if you're unwell, and really that'll help us as we move for, through the winter season. So thank you very much and a very good day for us today. I wish to start by picking up on a point of particular recognition to those that have physically been at the front of line of operations and critical to the safe return of many to their homes and family in the bailiwick. I want to recognise the huge effort made by our ports and welcome and testing teams who have managed more than 1,000 incoming passengers between the 1st and 8th of December alone and continue to do so. This is no mean feat and involves long hours in drafty halls and windy and wet conditions at the harbour and at the airport. We are all very grateful for your hard work. Equally and often unmentioned are our sea and air carriers bringing everyone home. I make particular reflection on our Orany crews that have worked in confined conditions, repeatedly at high levels of risk in the aircraft, sometimes having to start isolation themselves from their own families as a result of travelling passengers having tested positive on arrival. Thank you. We're equally grateful for the responsibility shown by our returning community who have been patient, followed the rules and put the safety of their fellow islanders first. We are proud to see the spirit of Guernsey together that continues to put our bailiwick in such a favourable position. Many of those working, whether it be our welcome teams, those scheduling and managing tests, or follow up on those in self-isolation, have come from different areas of the states of Guernsey or importantly, have joined us from the community to swell our numbers. We have retired nurses, airline pilots, and people from all walks of life helping to add to our limited resources. 
The team's work and sense of community is palpable, and we appreciate every one of you and all that you are doing. I'd like to take this opportunity to request tolerance and respect for those staff and volunteers working at our swab testing stations for the 7 and day 13 tests. These teams are working long hours and facilitating thousands of swab tests and there have been a number of cases where these st staff have received significant abuse dealing with delays as a result of the recent surge in high numbers of tests required. Please be patient as the teams work hard to get through the tests as quickly and efficiently as possible. We've used your feedback to adapt and improve the process wherever we can, but ultimately the importance is to carry out the tests as accurately as possible. There are currently more than 1,100 people in self-isolation. Hello to you all. Thank you for sticking to the rules and helping with this mammoth task. We look forward to seeing you all out and about and enjoying Christmas. We continue to have, have Beaux Azur as our chosen site for the Community Vaccination Centre. We heard and understood the concerns of the community voiced by as those regular losers of St John Loveridge and we acknowledge access to support and physical activity is very important to our mental health and well-being. Nevertheless, the location remains best suited and the mass vaccination programme understandably must take priority. Much effort is being made to support the various physical activity groups to try and secure alternative arrangements for sports that will be displaced and we're confident with compromise everyone's needs can be accommodated. This has very much been a collaborative approach with groups such as the Guernsey Sports Commission meeting with us to discuss and help with requirements and alternative options. We are grateful to our community for their patience and understanding. Unfortunately, COVID will not be taking time off for Christmas. I would assure our community that all our services will continue to ensure adequate resources will be in place to maintain the high levels of protection, monitoring and safety provided to date. Please continue to do your part in the spirit of Guernsey Together. As mentioned on many occasions by Dr Brink and Deputy Salisbury, any personal risk taken to deviate from the requirements and guidelines is a potential risk to our whole community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and very well said. Heidi. Thanks, Peter. Now, lately we've been holding uh, these briefings uh, once a fortnight, but as Deputy Fairbrush has said, two weeks from now is actually Christmas Day. And as I'm sure no one really wants to hear from us on that day, and I think everyone here would rather be somewhere other than this cold theatre too, barring any breaking developments, this will be the last briefing we hold this year. But given the news today that our first share of the vaccine has arrived and what that will mean for our community, together with the economic figures we've heard today that reflect the wider financial impacts on businesses, families and individuals, I just wanted to reflect for a moment on what an extraordinary year 2020 has been. In many ways, you might describe it as a year you want to forget, but we won't forget it. We won't forget the efforts of our entire community to get us where we are now, one of the most special places to be on the planet. Somewhere we can enjoy Christmas with a family with no restrictions at all. Somewhere we can go out and celebrate the new year as we want to. We won't forget the dedication of our frontline workers, doctors, nurses, all health and care workers, but also contact tracers, the welcome teams and staff at the ports supermarket staff, refuse collectors, teachers, emergency services and many others who during the first wave thought not of themselves but of their community, doing their jobs, knowing a new virus threatened our island but not really knowing what kind of risk it meant for them. We won't forget those for whom Christmas won't be merry, who find themselves separated from their family in the UK or elsewhere as we maintain the necessary restrictions on our borders that keep our community safe. We won't forget those whose world was truly rocked by the pandemic and the lockdown measures earlier in the year, who saw their weddings cancelled, who couldn't meet their new grandchildren except perhaps by a, a way of a wave through the window, or who went months unable to see elderly and unwell family in residential care. We won't forget those who held funerals for loved ones without their friends and family able to attend, or who could not say goodbye in person to those dear to them as they reach the end of their lives. We won't, and we must never forget the 16 lives lost. It has been one hell of a year, and there are still many challenges ahead. The arrival of the vaccine really is cause for celebration, 
but it will take time before the vaccine programme can significantly change how we manage the pandemic. And we must now really push forward with recovery. I am hopeful for 2021. I'm hopeful that the togetherness we saw this year will propel us forward next year and beyond. That is a task for all of us, whether in government, the private, se private sector, the third sector, or as individuals. We must work as one. On that note, I'd remind everyone that we've organised a drop-in for tomorrow between 10 and 12 at the Visitor Information Centre in town, where you can come and discuss anything you like with a few of us deputies. We've called it Let's Take Time to Talk, and we need to talk openly and honestly and constructively with each other going forward. Now, Christmas Day will mark exactly nine months since we went into lockdown. For me, it feels on the one hand like it was yesterday, but on the other so far away. Like yesterday, as it was such a monumental decision we had to make, but so far away as so much has happened since then. But throughout these months, what has been overwhelmingly apparent to all of us here is the strength of our community. We've come together across the islands and shown how much stronger we are as a result. We had a summer of amazing events, including the Big Day Out, Pride, Rakane Regatta and Vale Earth Fair. We're able to hold our own island-wide election and make it run smoothly, which is no mean feat at the best of times. So when you're sitting down for your festive lunch on Christmas Day, not only spare a thought for all those working that day to keep us safe, but also what we have done as a community and raise a glass to Guernsey together. And on that, at the end, we have something special that's been put together for you. We hope you like it. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes, I have to say. But anyway, Merry Christmas at the end of a year we'll never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And I'd like to thank you personally for all the assistance you've given me in my time as Chief Minister and President of the Civil Contingency Authority. Uh, Guernsey's benefited uh, considerably from your wise counsel. Now, members of the media, what questions would you like to ask? Yes, sir. Could you just identify yourself and say who you represent? Dave Wheeler, BBC Guernsey. Can I ask when exactly did the vaccine arrive this week in the island and why did you decide to postpone the announcement until now? Dr Brick, would you like to deal with that? So it arrived yesterday and we thought it was appropriate to announce it at the press conference. Our focus is always going to be on the safe arrival of the vaccine and on clinical matters and that's entirely appropriate and we thought um, announcing it today at the press conference would be the most timely way to do that. I could I agree with that. Uh, shame that the first question was slightly negative because uh, for a vaccine to arrive yesterday and to be uh, told publicly that it's arrived today I think it's pretty good actually. Uh, you may disagree but uh, you're entitled to your opinion and I'm entitled to mine. Who's, the, who's got the next question? Yes sir. Matthew Leach, the Bailiwick Express. Um, how will we be developing guidelines to the vaccine? Will we be following what the NHS suggests, perhaps? Um, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've developed what we call SOP standard operating practices, and that is everything from how we take the vaccine out of the fridge to how we transport it um, to where we need to, to give it, um, what labelling you require at each step, um, how you administer it, what precautions you need to take um, prior to administering it, um, what sort of support you need in the form of adrenaline and so on to um, cope with allergic reactions and how you dispose of the packaging as well. So we have spent a lot of time over the last um, couple of weeks making sure that we have all of those procedures in place. Thank you. Anybody with a question? Yes. Hello, Marina Jenkins, ITV News. Um, of course, this is great news for residential and care home staff. Um, for those caring at home and are looking after vulnerable people, um, where do they fit in to the priority list? So you're talking about carers yeah ca carers that are you know at home looking yes. after ill family members and things like that who might be over 80 themselves mm. um yeah where does that yeah. fit in? so um as part of the health and care um health and care group is we're looking at all of those not only health and care employed by the states of Guernsey, but also other providers. So indeed, the first group that we've prioritised are the care and residential home staff, which indeed are not employed by the states of Guernsey. So going down, 
With regard to um, carers working in a household setting, those will be assessed on an individual basis because they're obviously large numbers. So we're going down a risk stratification um, of those various groups and those will be included um, as we go down there. So what I would say again, whilst we don't want to get inundated with um, huge numbers of emails whilst we're trying to roll out the first bit, if people feel that they haven't been included and they should have been included, they are welcome to contact us. Nikki, can I just add to that? When, in terms of um, the vaccination of health and care workers, there's kind of two main reasons for that. One is to maintain the resilience, isn't it, of, of the health service, but also those are the people that might be possibly transmitting to more people, certainly in terms of community care and things. It, it's all about the spread of risk, and that's why we're looking at health and care workers first. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so Deputy Salisbury is quite right. It's, it's the um, and retaining the resilience of your system so people don't get sick. But also, although the data on transmissibility isn't there yet, even if there is a small effect, because a um, person working in the health and care system is going to see multiple people, some of whom will be vulnerable, is the additive effect is then quite large. Yes. Helen Bowditch from the Guernsey Press. Um, you said that the vaccine, the jabbing process is going to start next week. Is, so I take, is that Monday? And um, in the UK, they set up that the press were allowed to come along and take a, a photo of a nice, a lovely old lady who was receiving it. I was wondering, seeing as it's such a historic occasion, if you were going to set up something similar for Guernsey. Well, it won't be Monday, but... Uh... So it'll be starting on Thursday next week. Um, so we, uh, once we take the vaccine out of the um, minus 70, we have five days to administer it. So we can store it at two to eight degrees for five days. So we're going to administer Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So it gives us two days over the weekend um, to immunize. So we'll be immunizing up till about nine o'clock in the, in the evening. So that's how we're planning to do that. We haven't decided on um, whether um, we should invite someone to um, to film the first vaccination. We need to give it some consideration. We also need to consider what the views are of the people getting vaccinated. So we've always, whenever we've done a program like that, not only considered um, what would be nice to, to display, but also what the views of the people are and, and whether, whether they feel it would be appropriate. So I think it's really important. We've always had the Guernsey Together approach, and I think we need to stick with that. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, sir. Dave Wheeler from BBC Guernsey again. Uh, we had the news earlier in the week that two NHS staff uh, had a s adverse reactions to getting the jab. Uh, can you provide any reassurance to islanders with allergies and should they be concerned? Is there any clarity on that? Um, so um, that is one of the reasons why um, we're going to roll out the vaccine program in the first instance within the Princess Elizabeth Hospital. Um, this is a new vaccine and we've always erred on the side of caution and on the side of safety. So we have um, looked at those two allergic reactions that occurred and in fact the guidance has been changed somewhat to now exclude people who are actually carriers of EpiPens. I believe both of those people had profound allergies and both of them were carriers of EpiPens. So I think that's really important. However, we've engaged extensively, not only with our medical director, Dr. Peter Raby, but also the chair of our resuscitation committee within the Princess Elizabeth Hospital, and we have all the safeguards in place. So we're confident that we've got the right safeguards in place for the vaccine. Yeah, if, if I could just add to that, I think um, in, in, despite the arrival of the vaccination, one, one expects a hiatus of activity to go into there. Sometimes it's good to come second, and we're observing, and I don't think we're under the same pressure as some other jurisdictions that have got such high levels of prevalence. Actually, we've got two active cases uh, as we sit here this morning. So we're taking a very calm, rolled out approach, uh, starting with uh, some of our core healthcare and care workers, and we can move then towards uh, vaccination of the community as a whole. So I think it's, it's the sensible approach to take. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the Oxford vaccine. If another vaccine is approved, could you potentially roll out multiple at the same time? Yep. 
Correct, yes, that's the answer. We've, we've planned for the use of multiple vaccinations, and we've also planned when we looked at our vaccine storage that we'll be dealing with more than one vaccination. We've also planned in our scheduling program in that if you get vaccine A you're for the first dose, it's a two-dose schedule, you need vaccine A for the second dose. You can't have an A and B mix. Um, so um, we've planned that when we look at the allocation of vaccination, that we've got enough vaccination to give people the first and the second dose of the same dose of uh, the same type of vaccine. And so we've planned to deliver more than two. So if a third vaccine or a fourth vaccine became available, we'd be able to accommodate that as well. It's formed part of our planning process. Helena, then, you first. Oh, okay. I, um, uh, you said, I think, uh, that 975 vaccines arrived yesterday. Do you have any idea of when the next batch is going to come or any idea of time scales yet of when you'll move to phase two, phase three, that sort of thing? Um, so the answer is, is that we don't have a precise delivery schedule. Um, we're expecting at least another box which is 975 next week, but we need to make sure that if we've given people the first dose that we have enough for a second dose. Of course, we've got um, Christmas in between with the delivery schedules um, over that period of time. So we don't have a precise um, delivery schedule and we realize that this would be the case from the beginning. So from the beginning, we've planned to um, be flexible with our rollout and we fully acknowledge with a new program is we can't have a tablets of stone we've set this out and we're going to do this on this day is we want to be responsive and flexible so we will be able to so we've got all of the the groups we've got names of people and so on um, lined up but um, we will we will vary it according to the delivery so we're prepared to to either get more or less and we can accommodate both you were very patient, sorry, your question. That's quite right. Um, as more people get vaccinated in the UK and begin to hear, um, will this affect border restrictions? Of course, if you have had those two uh, doses and you are vaccinated and immune, um, will people be able to travel here and then not isolate for two weeks? So, I think the the thing about that. Sorry, how do I interrupt no. you? Um, so I think I think the thing about that we have to be um, realise that um, with the vaccination you have the first one and the second one, and we'd only consider someone protected a week after receiving the second dose of the vaccine. So for the BioNTech vaccine, that's a three week gap. For the Chadox Oxford vaccine, that's a four week gap. So this is going to take some months to roll out. While the programs rolled out, we will also then get information on the transmissibility, the impact on the vaccine on transmissibility. So I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but exactly when those um, restrictions would come to an end, it's impossible for us to say at the moment. I also want to emphasize that whilst we're in this critical time of administering the vaccine, we need to um, keep up our all the proportions that we've got so that we can administer the vaccine in the favourable position we're in. All I, was going to oh, sorry, say, all I was going to say is, again, it's what we've always done from the very start. It'll be based, what we do and what we change will be based on the evidence that we have. And it's too early to tell at the moment how it's going to roll out in, in terms of you know, transmissibility, as Nikki said. Yeah. It's the evidence. Be patient and tolerant, I think that's the message. Any other questions for anybody? Just looking. Yes. Is there any idea as to how a sort of certification program might work in regards to those who are vaccinated coming through the borders? Anything like that, or is it too early to say? I think it's too early to say, yeah. isn't it? It's it still is. going to be worked out. Yeah. I mean, all things will be considered, as it's been explained by Deputy Salisbury uh, and uh, Dr. Brink, this is an ongoing project. It'll take a long time. We're embarking on the biggest vaccination. Uh, process that Guernsey, the Bailiwick of Guernsey has ever had, probably the biggest in the world, I would have thought, overall, with all the vaccines go through all the various places. So it's something, it, it's a work in progress. In terms of people knowing whether, being able to show that they've had the vaccine, I think when, when people are vaccinated, they'll be given, I think, a little card to yeah. show, tell them, you know, show people that they've, they've had the vaccination. So that might be helpful. And if I could say we wouldn't unilaterally develop something like that because it might be like, for example, the yellow fever certificate that there's an international um, approved certification process which we would then look at engaging with. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Uh, you touched on this a little bit already, but I just wonder if you could expand a little bit more on your feelings about what it was like when the vaccines arrived yesterday. And do you expect a sort of emotional scenes next Thursday? You know, because you've been fighting this for months now. It's obviously going to be really important to you. Yeah. I think it's true. Dr. Brick was seen running around, jumping up and down. <laughs> but I think she's going to say something. Yeah, uh, we were really, really excited. It, it is like the light at the end of the tunnel for us. It's, it's what we've been hoping for, what we've been working towards. And we had a sort of quiet time of reflection, but also we were incredibly excited. So we were tracking the vaccine and we knew exactly where it was because it's, it's tracked as it came over to us and we knew when it had reached Portsmouth and we knew when it was on the way to us. And so it was an incredibly exciting um, 24 hours for us. So quite emotional, yes, and, and really hopeful, I think is, is how I'd put it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, following on from that, how have the care homes and um, carers uh, found the news? So, they the letters were delivered. We we haven't had specific feedback. We we've been been engaging through the with the care homes through our our care home cell, and so the letters were um, delivered to the various care homes last night, and we'll be getting feedback over the course of today. So. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so up until Monday, we'll then be planning the, the scheduling, the specific scheduling, because we also have to take into account certain people won't want to be immunised on certain days. So we're going to try and accommodate as much as we can um, what times people can be, um, can be immunised. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Kit Gilson, ITV News. Um, it was spoken about, I'm sure, before the vaccine was actually here, and um, as important that, that it is that we get through all of the demographics that require it most, um, will there ever be a cost to um, people further down the um, priority chain you mean, uh, of the vaccine? You mean we will we charge for it? No. No, 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 no. I think you had a question. Um, I just wondered, in terms of getting consent from some people, um, if uh, you know, for people with dementia and, and cognitive issues, uh, how, how do you go about that? So, been, sorry, carry on. <laughs> sorry. So we have a consent form, and we would go through the normal consent per, um, or normal consent process for people living with dementia or indeed other other forms of cognitive impairment. So, so that would be done through our normal process and we've developed a, a specific consent form. Yeah, because at the point's been made, uh, it's not mandatory. We clearly want as many people to take the vaccine as possible. We encourage everybody to take it. Uh, that will be for the best interest of the beta we could be on. And particularly where people, and Nikki was talking about people having EpiPens, who are likely not be able to have this vaccine, that might be able to have yeah. a later vaccine, but if they can't be vaccinated, we need those people who can be vaccinated to vaccinate, and that's how you get the herd immunity, not by letting the virus spread throughout the community. Uh, yes. Have you been recruiting quite a lot of people to be able to deliver this and get people to sign up and to train them up over the next kind of couple of months, few months? Yeah, so again, we've been absolutely overwhelmed by the number of nurses, doctors and so on that have come forward, volunteered, undertaken the training because not only is there general vaccination training, there's COVID specific training and we've been overwhelmed by, by the number of volunteers. And again, I think this is just another great example of Guernsey Together is that people have just come forward, they've done the training. We've had people say to us, well, you know, I'm happy to just come and volunteer and immunise. Um, so it has been a really, really... Um, positive process so we've got registrants in place to to administer the vaccine anything else yes sir this is obviously something to to celebrate um but do you have anything um to say or comment on about our friends in in, in jersey who are unfortunately not in the same position that we're in well of course we empathize sympathize uh with our our colleagues in jersey our neighbors in jersey our friends in jersey uh, and uh uh, we're sure that they will do the best they can. They're going to have a vaccination process and program, uh, and they will uh, do their absolute best to get their uh, their COVID problems under control. I don't know if anybody else would you want to add anything in relation to that, Heidi? No, I mean I certainly feel for them at this moment in time, but um, they are undertaking measures to hopefully bring it down. Yeah. I hope, I'll definitely wish them the best. I th I'd like to add. I think 
throughout this because you, you get an acceleration of positivity around the vaccination, which we all acknowledge is fantastic and we've all waited for it to come. But I think there must be a very clear message uh, uh, across this particular stage that we're at. It doesn't change one jot what we have to do to protect our borders, protect the requirements on Ireland in terms of our safety, because until you get the full net re results of this, until prevalence comes round, down in other jurisdictions, until we get through a, a high enough number in our community, we continue to maintain the diligence we have since we started and done so well. I yeah. think Paul Pearls yeah. made a really good, good point there, because these things, as we've seen, can change very, very quickly. And it's absolutely right, got to keep on going until yeah. the, the, the results of the vaccination programme are felt. We will not be relaxing at all, at all. Uh, it's a long uh, and continuous process. Any other questions? Yes. I just wondered if, there, if you'd ever had any sort of indication from the UK that they were going to look at us and say, well, you haven't even got COVID. And in the UK, there's people dying in hospitals. Has there any, ever been any sort of hint that they would restrict the amount of vaccines that we would get? No, absolutely not. So we've had tremendous support from the JCVI. Um, we've been allowed observer status um, at their board meetings, and that's been absolutely invaluable in our planning. And I think they've been nothing but, but helpful, um, cooperative and supportive of us. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. Anything else? I don't see anything else. Well, can I just say, uh, at the very end of this, after I've uttered my last word, uh, today at least, that there will be a video which Heidi has referred to. Please look at that, those that you can see it. It's so inspiring. It says so much for our community. Now, one of the journalists uh, talked about, well, perhaps we could uh, video photograph uh, the people who are the first people who are going to have the vaccination. The second person in the UK to be vaccinated was somebody called William Shakespeare. Uh, and those of you who have read Shakespeare will know there was one of his works was Macbeth, and there was Hubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble, said the witches. And we've had much Hubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble over the last uh, nine months or so. But we're coming out of that. But we must come out of it with vigilance. Lots of people have said thank you to so many people. I repeat all of that. I repeat it to every single citizen of the bailiwick that's acted responsibly, which overwhelmingly is the case. All the wonderful people that have given so much support uh, and done so much. Now, I'm a Tottenham Hotspur supporter, and of course it's a moment of glory for us at the moment. Uh, and their best ever player, in my view, was Jimmy Greaves. He was a master, an absolute master of uh, his skill. Uh, and he deserved all the praise that he ever got. We have the equivalent of that in Guernsey. She is the master of her particular discipline. We've been so fortunate to have Dr Brink. She's been the absolute star of our show. She's Jimmy Greaves. Uh, I don't think anybody could pass. I certainly, as a Tottenham supporter, couldn't pass higher praise on anybody than that. So uh, we're now, I'm going to wish everybody a happy Christmas. I wish everybody a really good new year. We'll put this terrible year behind us. The people of Guernsey, the bailiwick of Guernsey, have shown how splendidly they've resolved it. Now, I'd like everybody that has the opportunity, either now or later, uh, to reflect on the video that's about to be played.